Major funding for NOVA is provided by this station and other public television stations nationwide. Additional funding was provided by Allied Corporation, an advanced technology company proud to support outstanding science programming on public television. And the Johnson & Johnson family of companies, supplying health care products worldwide. These are a people with a past. Once this was the fabled kingdom of Lanka, whose palaces and pleasure gardens, temples and fountains were known throughout the ancient world. It was so perfect a place that some called it paradise. Suddenly, mysteriously, it all disappeared. The kingdom collapsed. The temples fell to ruin. The fountains ran dry. Now they've set out to reclaim their heritage using the technology of a new age. But theirs is a poor third world country. And they've pinned their hopes on a risky enterprise. An attempt to harness their most valuable resource. water. But they're taking a bold gamble, trying to reclaim the fountains of paradise. This is the island of Sri Lanka, shaped like a pearl, they say like a tear dropped off the vast subcontinent of India. Twenty-five thousand square miles, about half the size of New York State. Sri Lanka, it means splendid island in Sinhalese, but many Westerners probably still remember it by its former name, Ceylon. The population here, nearly 15 million in all, is a wide mix of racial, ethnic, and religious groups. Sinhalese, Tamil, Hindu, Muslim, Christian, Buddhist. Probably nowhere else in the world will you find so much cultural diversity in so small a space. Still, the age-old differences between the Sinhalese majority and the Tamil minority can erupt, causing considerable tension. But the centuries of sharing this island give them much in common, too. Most have their roots at the village level. And three out of four work in some form of agriculture. Mm -hmm. 
ඉතින් පරකුම්බ ආහරජ කාලේ වනන් දැන් ඉතින් සිංහලයා උපන්දා වනන් කරන්න ගොයිතනනේ බත අවස්ථයයි මේ බත් නිසානේ මිනිහෙක් ජීවත් වෙන්නේ වෙන රැකියාවකින් ජීවත් වෙන්න බෑ වෙන කර්මාන්තයක් කරත් කණ්ඩෝනනේ බත් ඕන බත් ටික කණ්ඩෝන ගොයිතන ප්‍රධානයි මොනම රැකියාවක් කරත් ගොවිතනට ඉහෙලින් රැකියාවක් නැහැ සිංහල රජ කාලේ ඉඳලා නේ ලෝක පැවති දෙක ඉඳලා ඉතින් මේ ගොවිතන් කරලා තමයි ජීවත් වෙන්නේ But the truth is Sri Lanka can't grow enough rice for its people Three quarters of the island surface is a flat parched plain the dry zone Farmers here are lucky enough to grow one crop a year. Sometimes not even that because of drought. Here in the southwest quarter of the island, the wet zone is where most of the population is concentrated. Most of the wealth, most of the agriculture too. There's enough rainfall here to provide two harvests a year. And in recent centuries Sri Lanka's survival has depended on this lush landscape. But despite the productivity of the wet zone, despite the fact that agriculture is the basis of the economy, this island has been forced to import much of its food supply for over 100 years. To understand why, we have to look beneath the island's idyllic facade at the troubled legacy this new nation carries with it. The island had always been a favorite spot along trade routes from the west. Arab traders called it Serendip. Greeks Taprobane. A medieval voyager was so enchanted by it he placed it only 40 leagues from paradise. But it wasn't until the 16th century traders from Europe came to stay. The Portuguese first, lured by the cinnamon trade. The Dutch soon followed. And finally the British. They called the island Ceylon and they left their mark here. Ceylon, more important than ever following the loss of Malaya and the East Indies, produces a great deal of a plantation economy growing tea, coconuts and rubber for the world market and vulnerable to the fluctuations of that market. Independence came in 1948. The first session of the first parliament of the new dominion was royally open. And afterwards, accompanied by the Governor General and the Prime Minister, Mr. Senanayaka, the Duke proceeded to Flagstaff. Here, the Premier hoisted Ceylon's own lion flag. The Crown Colony was now a responsible, independent member of the British Commonwealth of Nations. The new nation promptly embarked on an ambitious program of social reforms: free education, medical care, food subsidies for the poor. all of it supported by the export economy sri lanka had inherited from the british they continued to export tea and other commodities to the rest of the world while they imported rice wheat sugar and milk to feed their own population a lopsided economy and it began to crack under growing pressures By 1960, exports no longer brought the income they once had due to competition from other developing countries. Population growth was booming. Domestic rice production couldn't keep up. There weren't enough jobs. Productivity sagged, and with the oil crisis of 1973, their energy bill soared. The country was forced to spend more and more of its budget importing food and fuel. By the mid-1970s, they were at the breaking point. Sri Lanka's Minister for Lands and Land Development, Gamani Disanayake. We had about 1.2 million people unemployed out of a population of about 14.8. There were food shortages 
and an impending power crisis, so a shortage of energy, lack of foreign exchange to import the bare necessities, food queues in different parts of the country, in towns and in cities, and a country losing faith. So they looked for a solution. A bold undertaking conceived by the Sri Lankans themselves that they hope will alter, indeed fundamentally reshape the future of their island. The plan, the Mahaveli Development Project, is to harness the country's mightiest river and divert its water into the dry zone. There, in an attempt to alleviate rural poverty, 150,000 families will be resettled. They'll be given two and a half acre plots and water to grow their crops. Eventually, if it all falls into place, the rice they produce will make the country self-sufficient in its food supply. It's a sophisticated strategy for water management. The Mahaveli River flows down from the highlands. Four large dams will create reservoirs to store its waters. A complex of canals is to deliver water to irrigation sites in the dry zone. Eventually, over one million acres of land are to be made productive. Power generated from the project is meant to create new industry, open up jobs, reduce unemployment. And the cost of it all, one and a half billion dollars. An ambitious plan, the Mahaveli, and an expensive one. Originally, planners estimated it would take 30 years to complete, but a new government came to office in 1977, and to get the country moving again, they made a controversial and risky decision to build a major portion of Mahaveli not in 30 years, but in six. The race was on. Sri Lanka appealed for aid, and Sweden, Germany, Canada, the United States, Britain, Kuwait, and Japan stepped forward to help with construction and funds. Other donors included such international organizations as the World Bank, the Asian Development Bank, the United Nations. The project attracted attention worldwide, and became a major tourist attraction back home. By mid-1984, two of the four proposed dams were completed. Construction on the other two continued. Nearly 50,000 families had been resettled in the dry zone, with project water flowing to some of them. Huge reservoirs, spillways, earth-filled dams. The technology is modern, but the idea is over 2,000 years old. When today's engineers chose a site for one of their dams, they made an extraordinary discovery, a stone embankment an ancient sluice way. Engineers living 1,500 years apart had chosen the same spot to erect a dam. Now, in the shadow of the new dam, this archaeological find is being preserved, a reminder of the monumental achievement created here. A network of storage tanks and canals, it was the most advanced water delivery system in the ancient world. At a time when Britain was a Roman colony, America a home for nomadic tribes, a great civilization flourished here, all of it based on irrigation. 
fabulous walled cities were built, jeweled citadels, monasteries with pools where 5,000 monks could bathe at the same time. The Kingdom of Lanka exported its food surplus to the rest of Asia and became known as the Granary of the East. Under the guidance of those Buddhist priests, the arts of sculpture, architecture, and poetry thrived. Buddhism took root here early, by the third century BC, and became inextricably bound up with the national identity of the Sinhalese. They view their island as especially blessed by the Lord Buddha and themselves as guardians of that faith. If religion was one unifying force for this culture, the other was water. For 15 centuries, every village had a temple and a reservoir. The capital city was surrounded by them. By the 1300s, the kingdom was no more. It had fallen to ruin, destroyed by outside invasion, civil war, and malaria of epidemic proportion. Today, every school child knows the words of the greatest of their ancient kings, Parakrama Bahu. Let no drop of water flow into the sea without first growing a grain of rice. In his time, the island produced enough food for all its people. And that is the same goal Sri Lanka has set for itself today with this new water project. But they're taking huge risks building the Mahabeli. In recent years, the project has swallowed up half of the government's capital budget and contributed mightily to an annual inflation rate of 23%. It's disrupting the environment and causing enormous social upheaval. Thousands upon thousands of families are being settled on the new lands. For most of them, it's the chance of a lifetime to own some land. Indeed, there's a long waiting list to get into the project. But for others, it's not a matter of choice. These wet zone paddy fields belong to the village of Aluthvala. Rice has been cultivated here for centuries by the same families on the same plots of ground. But now this land is to be flooded, turned into a reservoir behind the new Victoria Dam. Today, 65 families in this village are preparing to leave their ancestral home. The men will go first to set up temporary housing in the new dry zone settlements. The women and children will follow later. Head of one of the families, Mr. R. Y. G. Pallas. In all, some 43,000 Sri Lankans will lose their homes to the project. Their villages will disappear, and so will many of their old traditions. For them, the price of progress is high. In a parting ceremony, the Buddhist priest reminds them their homes are being sacrificed for the good of the Sri Lankan people. Taking refuge in the Buddha, taking refuge in the Dharma, taking refuge in the Sangha. It's a familiar Buddhist prayer. 
But today the priest invokes the Hindu god Vishnu as well, asking that he see them safely on their way. Mr. Paulus's daughter attaches a spray of coconut flower. It's a traditional gesture of good fortune to wish them a safe journey and prosperity in the new land. संपूर्ण <laughs> नियम जाले आप दं वातुरों ना आंट ऐत्ते में नहीं वातुरों ना आंट बोंड ना आई थिंग ये वाब गिना दिन ने किसी बी बट पाम ना आई ना आंट दे दियो डांटे ये किसी में देख किसी हमारों ने ये वाब जालो ये वाटे याना कांग इतिंग हो काल वाले तो कुछ इतिंग जाले गी उतनी इतिंग वो यहाँ में देख वाग Mahavelli project assists them with their move and provides transportation. Each family will be given two and a half acres of cropland and half an acre for the homestead. Enough land it's calculated to support a family of five. This is where the villagers are going, an area in the dry zone being opened up for the settlers. One couple who chose to move here remembers what it was like when they arrived nearly two years ago, Al Hakun and his wife Samawati. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Eating a he him and even a woosh in a doing. Eating polty and no costy and no. Think Kumuhundu to Watura Sani Pai. And the Gotam Ehe Lamai dancing up his school a langa. Distancely a langa. Tapal Gantur or Langa Tieni. Samu Pagari Langa Tieni. The school and Lame could have been a dipalo and his school. 
Making sure the benefits of a huge high technology project actually reach the small farmer is probably the most difficult task of all. So here at the planning office, they try to anticipate the settlers' needs. Resident manager of one resettlement area is Jayantha Jayawardena. In earlier colonization schemes, or settlement schemes uh, as they are now called, they found that uh, the land commissioner's department laid out the lands, the irrigation department did the irrigation system, and uh, they brought in the settler families from various parts of the country, showed them their plot of land, and uh, gave them the irrigation facilities and went off, leaving these settlers to find their feet, as it were. But now the Mahavali has found that these, uh, that the fact that there isn't somebody to help the settler when he originally arrives and tries to settle down, uh, as a result of that, the Mahavali has now placed equal emphasis on community services. Galneva, a new town in one of the settlement areas. In 1977, there was nothing here. They had to build shops, banks, a post office. And they had to organize bus service, clinics, schools. In short, everything a community needs. Mr. Jayawardena. When I first came here three and a half years ago, settlement had just started and uh, the settlement process was being accelerated. And at that time, there were various difficulties. There weren't uh, proper roads. The settlers were moving in. Because of the accelerated program, uh, settlers had to come in. Then we had problems of distributing land. Then there were insufficient services like medical, educational, communications, transport, all those uh, these things. But uh, over a period of time, we have been able to consolidate our activities and concentrate on uh, getting these uh, services to the settlers as fast as possible. These services are essential if the project is to achieve two of its most important goals, alleviation of rural poverty, self-sufficiency in the nation's food supply. The project now provides new arrivals with their first year's food supply and the building allowance. Settlers are paid to dig the field channels that will eventually bring water to their land. They build their homes, prepare their fields, while they wait for the water to arrive. Godfrey De Silva, irrigation engineer. So what we have in Sri Lanka in what we call the major irrigation projects, either they are in the Mahavali or outside, is a system where water from one source has to be distributed to thousands of farmers who are scattered over a wide area. Each farmer holding around two and a half acres, which is a very small extent. And to get water from this system to these two and a half acres involves the construction of a large network of main canals, branch canals, distributary canals, and field canals with thousands and thousands of structures, gates, control gates, things like that. At that level, it's purely a technical matter. At the level of tapping the water at the source, the Kalaveva storage tank seven square miles of water, a veritable inland sea. It was originally built in 300 AD to supply the ancient capital city of Anuradhapura. It's been renovated now and incorporated into the Mahaveli project. Once again, it's part of a complex irrigation system delivering water to dry zone farms. It's all gravity fed, controlled by sluice gates. The entire system must be carefully managed to make certain the water gets where it's supposed to go. In water management, it is not merely a matter of channels and engineering. That there is a lot more to do than that. The understanding of people and uh, behavior of people and interaction of people, efficiency of officers, and a lot of other factors besides really technical matters. 
Project Water has made a difference to Alakun and his family. With their first crop of rice already harvested and the second underway, the future looks hopeful. From savings, they've managed to replace their first temporary shelter with a more substantial home. They even have a pet, Chuti, the wild boar they found as a piglet in the jungle nearby. The children are established in the new school, and Somawatli volunteers her time to help out at the monthly medical clinic. Malnutrition was a problem for early settlers here. Food rations were limited, and many families weren't getting a balanced diet. So the project set up a supplemental feeding program, which Somawatli helps administer to pregnant women and to children. <laughs> Gradually, a community is growing up around the Alakoons. A Saturday market has been organized by the project, and merchants come from all over the island to sell their wares, clothing, cooking oil, tea, spices. The next step is to build a temple. The settlers here are determined to keep their Buddhist traditions alive. Farmers in the new settlements want to carry on a centuries-old tradition, offering the first rice of every harvest to the temple. There were villagers living in the dry zone long before the project came. The Mahabeli has incorporated them into the new irrigation scheme, changing the way they farm. Uh, then messing market, you know, had lazy Kumbura to give Kumbura me, a son, I do not. If you then eat a dollar till for her at the anything, as soon as the Mahan city, I'm sure Kumbura are dying on Bula. This is Thomas Pereira, a pioneer in the project. He's been farming here since it began back in 1977. Thomas always liked farming, and this was his first chance to get some land of his own. <laughs> Kisi 
Like other farmers here, Thomas has issued water according to a prescribed plan. The water is released for a specific number of hours every week. The farmers on each field channel must take their share in rotation to ensure a fair and equal distribution. Thomas now gets about two to three times the rice yield a farmer in the wet zone can expect. Thomas Pereira is an example of what this project is trying to achieve. He's self-sufficient and able to put aside something for the future. But many settlers here have not been so fortunate. Water, it's the lifeline here. Thousands of farmers have been promised an adequate and reliable supply. Their livelihood depends on it. Yet the system that's supposed to deliver the water is plagued with snags, problems that keep them from getting what they so desperately need. Susantha De Silva, unit manager here. This is an example of a well-constructed, well-maintained field channel. The embankments are solid and hold firm. The water flows freely through the channel to the farmer's plot. Here on this channel, where water buffalo have trampled the embankment, some leakage has occurred onto adjoining dry ground. This channel needs tending, 
It's overgrown with weeds. The embankment is in poor repair. As a result, the flow of water is impeded. now all these people have to share the same source of water and according to a very scientific system. But the problem is that most of these people are not really aware of how the system operates. And therefore, their participation in the operation of the system is very minimal. Now this, I think, is the root of the problem. Because uh, the success of the water management system depends on the performance of individual farmers. And when individual farmers do not perform well, due to various reasons, the whole system breaks down. Some farmers aren't performing in the manner the project planners intended. But by the same token, the project itself has fallen short of the farmers' expectations. They accuse officials of faulty construction, poor management. My biggest headache at the moment uh, is mainly irrigation. Now, when I, when I say biggest headache, I'm, I'm talking in terms of the problems that are projected to me from the settlers. Irrigation facilities in, uh, in a number of instances are apparently inadequate or insufficient, or they have problems of uh, broken channels, insufficient water coming down. So that, I would say, is the, not the biggest headache, but uh, the, one of the major problems that I face. And this we are now systematically working at, at consolidating the irrigation system. This, uh, these problems arise as a result of the fact that we have started this program and decided to accelerate it. And naturally, when you do things very fast, there are certain instances where one does not give uh, the channels and construction work the supervision it deserves because one is moving on uh, fairly fast. It's a complex process, trying to coordinate project aims and still meet the needs of individual farmers. And when it's done in a hurry, the problems escalate. In mid-1983, nearly 60% of Mahaveli's farmers were not getting the water they were promised. What's gone wrong? Clearly, some responsibility lies with project management, trying to do too much too fast. Other factors, such as the recent three-year drought in Sri Lanka, are simply outside human control. But there's one key problem that's not unique to the Mahaveli. Indeed, it plagues irrigation projects around the world. How to ensure that farmers at the end of the line, the tailenders, get their share of water? In theory, the members of each turnout group are supposed to share equally in the water issued to their turnout area. 
Each takes his turn irrigating his field according to a prescribed pattern of rotation. In practice, however, the farmers closest to the turnout control gate often take more than their fair share, leaving the farmers at the tail end with little or none. The problem has become so acute here that some tail enders have taken matters into their own hands, smashed the control gates in order to release more water onto their own land. I had the habit of always work, uh, walking down a canal, going into a farmer's house, having a talk with him, asking him how he's getting on. And I had the habit of going into houses even at tail ends of canals. And I used to see the, the stark disparity in, uh, in standards of living. In some families where the children are half starved or unable to uh, maintain themselves. And in some other homes you find them very comfortable and happy. And, that large disparity in incomes and standards of living, I used to personally observe during my visits to the farmers' houses. This problem of the head ender versus the tail ender has caused terrible inequities in many third world irrigation projects and has contributed to the collapse of some. Now it threatened the success of Mahavelli. Instead of the cooperative undertaking every water delivery system must be, the farmers here were pitted one against the other each out for himself. That gave me this uh, bothering feeling that there should be some way out of this, uh, that if the farmers are brought in, promised that they would be given their share of water, that there should also be a, a way of fulfilling that promise, and that we should no longer uh, ignore that problem and keep on sort of increasing the misery of these farmers. So that, that I think, brought me to a point where I started experimenting with solutions and trying to find out whether the, the, the theories I had in mind really worked, and I found them very feasible and practical. De Silva and others in Mahavelli realized it was time to open up a dialogue between project and farmers, and among the farmers themselves. This is a meeting of Irrigation Turnout Group 69. Al Hakun and Somawati are part of the group. Pamane, <laughs> so, a farmer with a stone can sabotage the goals of the project. In 1983, the project began experimenting with this approach in a few areas of Mahavelli, and soon realized if this complex irrigation system is to work, the farmers themselves must be brought into the Mahavelli management. Once you bring the people into the operation of the scheme, into the decision-making process, and then you add parallel to that, you, st you commence a uh, scheme of educating the people on the various aspects of the project and uh, how the thing operates, there is experience in several places, like Galloway, for instance, where we have just started the project under USAID. In Minipay scheme, where the, under the irrigation department, we tried out a similar project. The remarkable success that we got, the changes in water use, the solving of the tail enders problems, to such a large extent, purely by organizing the farmers to come into the decision-making process, to share the responsibility, and to participate in the management. This has shown remarkable results that gives us hope that it is really a feasible solution. Only difference being that it is far more difficult than merely spending money and constructing concrete dams. It is getting together with people, working with people, trying to organize people and trying to build new systems. 
it is far more difficult and complex, but since we have no alternative in Sri Lanka, because we cannot abandon the schemes that we have, neither can we stop the schemes that we have in mind. Sri Lanka's government is determined to push ahead with Mahabeli. Its leaders are mindful of the success of those ancient irrigation works, and they're trying to resurrect that past glory today. But they've tried before. In recent years, there have been a number of attempts to recolonize the dry zone, and none have lived up to expectations. Indeed, some were outright failures. So it's hard to assess what the long-term effects of this one will be. Certainly, the scale of the project and its acceleration are upsetting the fragile island environment. Hundreds of thousands of acres of jungle cover have been torn up. Tropical forests where Sri Lankans have gathered their firewood for thousands of years. Animal habitats have been destroyed as well. Elephants herded into wildlife preserves. Can this small island nation withstand such environmental and social upheaval? Is the destruction of tropical forests and ancient villages too high a price to pay for progress? But not to pursue the Mahaveli, the government feels, would risk a return to the economic and social chaos of the 1960s and 70s. Mr. Gamini Disanaika, the minister in charge of the Mahaveli project. So we feel strengthened that we should go on doing what we have done. And the fruits of Mahaveli really will flow after the first six years. The land will be alienated, families will be settled, new road systems will be operational, the power that is coming from Mahaveli will be available cheaper to the factories and to the industries who thereby will be able to plan better. So these are the consequences of pushing through this vast development program self-sufficiency in energy, self-sufficiency in food, which would be the foundation on which any society can rest. Again, Tatra Avachi Vidilbale, Victoria Link, Kotmala, Hamekem, Lebanon, Lanka, Lanka, Tavachi Vidilbale, Lebanon. It's a good opportunity to be writing one of the Kantel Kisima of Stapin. Then to Lanka, Avachi Vidilbale, to Kansas, Lux Hatta Konegina. It's a good opportunity, Lux Hatta, and the other three grand. ஏன் but such enthusiasm is not unanimous. A note of caution comes from the settlers themselves. It's they who are taking the biggest risk. <laughs> Sri Lanka faces an enormous challenge as it tries to become self-sufficient and economically sound. And to help achieve that goal, the nation has pinned its hopes on Mahaveli. A vast and risky undertaking, it's expensive, disruptive, and for many, the economic benefits seem a long way off. A monumental gamble, the Mahaveli. In time, the technical problems can probably be overcome. But their biggest problem remains the social organization needed to make the technology work. Can the people involved, project officials and settlers, government planners and rural poor, can they learn to work together to manage and maintain this complex irrigation system? 
How this was accomplished by the ancient civilization here is not entirely clear. There appears to have been an elaborate irrigation bureaucracy that set down strict rules with any transgression severely punished. That kind of a rigid system will not work for Sri Lanka today. They cannot reclaim all of the past. Instead, they are struggling to create something new, a cooperative venture suited to themselves and to this century. For a transcript of this program, send $4 to NOVA, Box 322, Boston, Massachusetts, 02134. Please be sure to include the show title. Major funding for NOVA is provided by this station and other public television stations nationwide. Additional funding was provided by the Johnson & Johnson family of companies supplying health care products worldwide. and Allied Corporation, an advanced technology company proud to support outstanding science programming on public television. A companion book, Nova, Adventures in Science, published by WGBH and the Addison Wesley Publishing Company, is available in libraries and bookstores nationwide. <laughs>